security? There's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the party. Today is Thursday, April 11, 2024, episode 598, creeping up on 600 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Brief Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier. And over the next 45 minutes or so, me, Marcus Kyler from the Eat Crew, Yee. Casually Joseph from the Car, Tom Bishop from the Boot, not only IT, Space Tacos first in comments, carried down in the great state of Texas, Joel Belton. Coming to us from the underground lair, Ms. Julian from the Green Mount, Jay and Michelle, Hemoglobin, folks over on LinkedIn like Raymond Cruz and Logan Fuller, long timers and first timers. We're all going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. And I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories, meaning what can you do with this information? What does it mean to us in the larger context? How can we use this information to drive cyber risk reduction for our business stakeholders? And if you're like, well, I don't have business stakeholders, Jerry, what do I do? Don't sweat it. If you're looking to break into the industry, we got you covered. Me, you, Jenny Housley, Kimberly from the couch. We are going to be talking about key terminology, key stories, macro level events, concepts, breaking down some common conventions that you should know about. And the networking is phenomenal. Say what's up in chat. You'll be surprised how supportive and inclusive this community is and how welcoming it is. What's up, Chelsea Ray Waterhouse? Good to see you. Wow. All right, now, before we dig into the sh stories of the day, before we start face melting, I want you to know I do not research or prep for any of these stories. I may look buttoned down and put together, but I'm actually a hot mess express, but that's okay. 598 episodes in a row, and we're still chugging along, so it's working out pretty good. I do want to say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsors. Those organizations that support Simply Cyber so I can get up every morning, even when it's like a tsunami typhoon thing outside and get into the Buffer Osier Flow studio and put this show together. Starting with my good friend, Eric Taylor and the squad over at Barricade Cyber Solutions. Whoa, look at this, new technique, new technique. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But guess what, y'all? All of you know it, and if you don't, you're about to find out. Barricade Cyber Solutions, they know how to yeet the damage done by cyber incidents and get those threat actors <laughs> out the environment. Pick them up, chuck them out, catch me outside. How about that? Catch me outside. How about that? So go to barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. If you're dealing with a hot mess incident, Believe me, you want to have someone like that on speed dial. Casually Joseph from the car. You know what? He's like the lead. He's like the uh, piano guy from the uh, the band Sticks. You youngs, Google it, okay? But like he's just operating two keyboards at the same time. Maybe driving and operating a keyboard. That's Casually Joseph live looking from the car. I also want to say shout out and love to Anti-Siphon Training. Anti-Siphon Training. If you didn't know, great people. They are absolutely disrupting the traditional cybersecurity training industry by providing high quality, cutting edge education to everyone like you, BJ and Brian Bates and Brian Mulder, Mohammed, Vladimir Rodriguez on LinkedIn. Everybody gets some action over at Anti-Siphon Training, cutting edge education, regardless of financial position, giving every student the opportunity to learn skills, practice what is taught, and most importantly, engage with a community that's fun, inclusive, and all about learning. Yes, Satalpa, I went there. Sticks on a Thursday morning. Come at me, bro. Catch me outside. How about that? 
All right, now I want you to know every single episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Brief is worth one half of a CPE. Now I know SSD and Jeff Watala just looked at each other and were like, dude, I'm not rolling out of bed for more than one, for less than one CPE. Here is the trick. They stack. So do a half today, a half tomorrow, two and a half a week, 10 a month. Just show up, say what's up, grab a screenshot in chat, and you will get those CPEs. And at the end of the year, one time, you don't have to enter every single day. Just do a bundle and say, simply cyber daily cyber threat brief, January 1st to December 31st, 365 times 0.5. And please, I know we don't do weekends and we don't do um um holidays, right? So oh, obviously so serious. Oh, get out of here. I'm not I'm not done with my intros. I'm not done with my intros. We gotta give me more music. All right, listen. They stack up. And if you don't know what to say in chat, hashtag team SC Jacob Wirtz a member. Love it, love it, love it. Hashtag Team SC. Because what? We're one Simply Cyber community. It's easy as that. Love the community. I happen to be the guy yelling into the mic and staring into the camera, but I'm also a member of the community, and I'm very, very proud of what this community has accomplished and what it represents in the greater picture of the cybersecurity industry. So much love. And if it's your first time here, oh, you might be like, what's up all this music? What's all? Is this like a, a rave? What are we doing here? Should I go bust a glow stick and throw it in my mouth and then start doing this move? Right? No, we're just we're just having fun. Work doesn't have to suck. OK, now the final thing I'll say is if it is your first episode here, drop a hashtag first timer in chat hashtag first timer in chat and get your special prize. Right. You got a special emote, a special sound effect. Hashtag first timer in chat. We love welcoming our first timers, uh, letting them know it's okay. Also, I've seen some of you on Reddit sharing uh, the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief. If you do want to share uh, the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief with your network or with friends, the easiest way to share it is simply tell them simplycyber.io slash streams with an S. Simplycyber.io slash streams with an S. Yes. Oh, gross, J.E. and Michelle. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, we've got our first first timer. Traveler is in chat. Welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. Robin's first time in chat, stepping into the light. Judges, are we? We are. Yes, Robin, welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. Fern Malo, welcome to the party, pal. The party, hey, and all those squad members, I know there's a thousand squad plus members. Go ahead and help me out with the John McLean, welcome to the party, pal. We got to let these first timers know how welcome they are in the community. Let's go. All right, 5,000th timer. <laughs> Jay, I love it. All right, guys, hey, as fun as it is to uh, play around and say what's up, we do have work to do. We do have work to do. So go ahead and pour your coffee, pour your tea. If you're in uh, Australia and it's nighttime, pour your, uh, you know, your old speckled hen or whatever you're drinking out there. And uh, let's settle in and get ready. Um, it is Thursday, which is Dan Reardon's uh, what's your meme Thursday. So we got a custom meme coming up, uh, later on in the show. Thank you squad members. I see all of you drop in the, uh, John McClain. It's absolutely brilliant. I love it. All right, y'all do me a favor. It's that time. I need you to sit back, get comfortable, relax. And let's let the cool sounds of the hot news Percy! wash over all of us in an awesome wave. I will see you at the mid roll cybersecurity headlines. These are the cybersecurity headlines for Thursday, April 11th, 2024. I'm Rich Straffolino. CISA expands automated malware analysis. Back in November, CISA opened its malware next-gen service to government and military workers. This provides automated analysis of malware samples and other suspicious digital artifacts with a combination of static and dynamic tooling. CISA will now open submissions on malware next-gen to other organizations, although only authorized users can access results. Since opening the tool, CISA said 400 registered users submitted 1,600 files to review. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is really cool. I didn't know about this. I don't know if anyone else uh, has used this, but uh, CISA, Our Lady of uh, Cybersecurity, Jen Easterly. Thank you, Shuttle Crab and J.E. and Michelle. We do have an emote if you're a squad member here and you didn't know. Uh, for one, Jen Easterly. 
Uh, spoiler alert, I am in Jen Easterly's orbit. If you guys don't, <laughs> for you first timers like Fern Malo and others, uh, Jen Easterly is the director of uh, CISA. I think she's phenomenal. I think she has moved uh, you know, the public sector, government, public-private collaboration efforts forward like a light year. Um, and uh, I am, you know, Bryson Bort is friends with her. Ken, um, oh my God, I can't believe I can't think of Ken's last name. Uh, Ken Bible, DHSC, so uh, familiar with her. So uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm slow playing trying to get Jen Easterly for Simply Cyber Live. Okay, I digress. Now, CISA has made numerous tools available to the private sector at no cost. Um, some of them are proactive, like you can get a vulnerability scan, you can submit things and get feedback. Also, some of them are more kind of ongoing threat intelligence. They have the known vulnerability, a known exploited vulnerability catalog to help you prioritize your vulnerability management, which is super awesome, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, this right here, didn't know about it, but a malware analysis engine, which um, honestly, they called it next gen, ma malware next gen, which is a little um, eye rolly. Like the term next gen uh, has been bastardized by the uh, commercial elements of the cybersecurity industry. So like when you hear next gen or single pane of glass or digital transformation or AI enabled, it's like, oh my God, next gen, right? So whatever, I'm sure they did it for marketing purposes, but what is it? It's a malware analysis engine. I haven't used it. I will sign up for it. I don't see why I wouldn't be able to. I do have a consulting business and uh, I will test it out. I will tell you this. The value of a malware analysis engine is huge. If you find a weird artifact on your network or on an endpoint or end user calls up and says, hey, I downloaded this thing and it's weird or someone emailed me this thing, it's weird, right? You have a couple options. One, you can statically analyze it, right? Two, you could dynamically analyze it yourself on your own, like, you know, sandbox area or whatever. But those doing malware analysis is really, really fun, but it's also wicked dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, you can, you can like Plaxico Burris and basically shoot yourself with the malware, which is not good. Two, you could not know what you're doing and just not know how to analyze it. So like you're looking at it and you're like, it looks good to me. And instead it's just like this, like, um, you know, multi-fanged leech, triple-headed hydra looking thing. And you're like, looks good. Let's go. No. So it's, it's dangerous. It's complicated and it, it requires skill. Now enter malware analysis engines. Personally, I like any dot run. If you haven't used any dot run, I'm not a sponsor or they're not a sponsor or anything like that. But, um, but if they're in the chat and they would like to let's go, but, uh, any dot run right here, this is a wicked awesome malware analysis engine. You can basically drop anything in here and it'll dynamically detonate it for you and then show you all the network connections it opens up, all the processes it generates. It'll identify any type of malicious telemetry, any known bad IPs, you know, process hollowing. It gives you a full report. Any dot run is phenomenal. Now it's free to use if you're, you know, just putting stuff up in there, but obviously it's a paid service if you want to get um, private, you know, your, your stuff private and a little bit thorough, more thorough analysis and the ability to configure. So if you can't afford any dot run, maybe this is a good option. Also the public version of any dot run has worked fine for me in the past to get me what I needed. So I don't know how this compares to that. If anyone in chat has used this CISA, um, uh, malware analysis engine, let me know, but I mean, I'll check it out for the sake of, uh, due diligence. And I, and I love that CISA has made this available, but I'm, I'm telling you, any dot run, like, like I'm just sure of like ripping open my button down and having an any dot run Superman symbol on my shirt because it really is that good a service. Let's go. U.S. Cyber Command launches hunt forward missions. In written testimony to the Senate Armed Services Committee, NSA Chief and Air Force General Timothy Hoff disclosed the Cyber National Mission Force engaged in 22 hunt forward operations last year. This marks the first time U.S. Cyber Command has confirmed a figure for such missions. These missions resulted in over 90 malware samples collected that it subsequently released to the <laughs> cybersecurity community. We don't know specifically where these took place, but missions occurred in 17 countries across all of the Defense Department's geographic combatant commands. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh man. I I love I love being, you know, a gray-haired old and having the perspective to see how like uh using certain words to uh you know, push a certain narrative or to uh, or to have a uh um it's not propaganda, but it it does suggest a certain like interpretation. Hunt forward. That <laughs> hunt forward means um, striking before they strike, right? Like it's it's going and looking threat hunting in um, systems and environments that are not ours, but allies of ours that we suspect may be compromised, and then hunting forward through that. That's my understanding of this, right? Which could even lead you further into adversarial environments. But the idea here is that I believe I believe the idea behind the hunt forward initiative, which by the way was um. There, there was like an executive order uh, maybe two years ago. I, I'd have to get my facts right. And I love um, if the mods have it. There was there was an executive order a couple of years ago that outlined like five pillars, right? I think I did a brief with Jack Scott on this. It, it outlined five pillars and like zero trust was one and multi-factor everything was another. And I'm pretty sure that same executive order from President Biden, or it could have been Trump on his way out, but I think it was Biden, was like, we're, we're basically going to stop being... Um, the, the whole idea here is that the United States has just been like the, the big kid with the hand on the child's head and the child is swinging, right? If you, if you kind of picture what I'm saying. So like we're holding the forehead of the smaller child and the child's swinging and we're not doing anything, right? We're just like letting them swing and we're holding them back and like, whatever. That's been the U S posture for a long time. Like, like we're big, we're strong. Like, ugh, we'll just let the arrows bounce off of us, but like, we're Okay. The, this this mission, this this kind of principle here of, of hunt forward or hack back is like we're letting our hand off of the uh, the child or the small person head. Right. And now they're swinging and moving forward and we're like stepping aside and just kicking their feet out from under them. Again, we're not actively attacking them. It's like a keto like we're not we're not like, you know, holding them and punching them in the face. We're just allowing them to uh, interact with us as we kick them down. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of like what this is. Um, so basically the United States said we're done just kind of sitting here being reactive. We're going to take action and we're done with that, which by the way, I'm a huge, uh, advocate of this isn't a political show, but just to let you know, um, I do support this. I do think that there is a place for this. Um, 17 missions isn't a lot, uh, yeah, 17. Oh, thank you very much, Joel Belton. This is that executive order right here. Um, accept all cookies, disrupt and dismantle threat actors. Oh, wait, you guys can't really see it. Um, let me see if I can, God dang. Just, just let me control F please. Um, oh, the words aren't coming up anyways. Um, it, it's, this executive order was like a thing. Um, this may not have been it anyways. Um, they definitely had basically endorsement to go hack things, um, which which they've been doing for years anyways. Um, so anyways, good to see the missions are going well. Um, this is just one of those like Cyber Command executing missions. I wouldn't be surprised to see like a digital Jason Bourne movie coming out soon. Um, you know, like, like Black Hawk Down or one of these, um, you know, kind of Uber action movies, except... Uh, with like one of these hunt forward missions, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, I'll take one. I'll take two actually. Um, if you're interested, it looks like the um, Air Force general over the who leads the NSA and was kind of uh, chair over the 17 different country 22 missions had to report to Congress what the heck he's been doing with all that money. So if you're interested, there's a link here. I'll drop it in chat. It's a PDF. This could be a good read. Also, um, basically also might want to point out that this is an awesome use case of chat GPT. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do chat GPT on this, but damn it. Uh, maybe I'll do it if there's time during the mid roll, but like, basically you can drop this PDF. Like I'm, I'm actually going to show it as a demonstration. Um, hold on a second. Stay, stand tuned. Stay. All right, let's keep going. Spectre V2 Linux Boogaloo. Researchers from VU Amsterdam.
Yes, Jay and Michelle, the U.S. Air Force, where you're issued an umbrella, not a weapon. <laughs> documented a new version of the speculative execution side channel flaw on modern Intel processors, creatively called Spectre V2. This new attack specifically works against Linux systems through branch target and branch history injections. This opens the door to allowing an attacker to read memory data and break isolation privilege levels. The researchers say existing Spectre mitigations don't work on V2, while Intel recommends disabling unprivileged extended Berkeley packet filters and enabling supervisor mode execution protection and enhanced indirect branch restricted speculation features. The researchers released a tool to identify vulnerable code segments in the Linux kernel. All right, <clears throat> here we go. Spectre is back. Guess who's back? Back again. Spectre's back. Tell a friend. Okay, so check it out. Um, malware, uh, not malware, um, Spectre and, um, what was the other, it came out at the same time, Spectre and Meltdown, right? Spelt yeah. Spectre and Meltdown came out at the same time. Uh, if you didn't know this, this was like 2016, I think 2017, maybe, um, they even got logos back when we used to do logos for vulnerabilities. I don't know why that that's gone out of vogue, but, uh, I was, I'm a huge fan of, uh, them. Uh, these both had to do with like, basically, um, they're, they're essentially like side channel attacks, which means it's not really the code that's getting attacked. It's the actual, um, the way the architecture of the computer is set up and the processor. Basically, here's the deal without without giving everybody a popsicle headache. Very simply put, um, for modern computer architecture and for processing, there are some um, pieces of information that the CPU, well, that the, 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 the CPU is thinking it's going to need anyways. So it loads it in cache memory. I think L1 cache memory, which is like, which is like right next to the processor. It's like the fastest. If you think RAM is memory, think that there's like cache, like L2 and L1 caches that are even closer to the processor than RAM, right? Which means you can access it wicked fast. To me and you, it, it's it's almost um, negligible, but you know, for processor speeds and stuff, it's fast, right? The idea is that these, um, speculative or guessed uh, values can sit in the cache. And the problem is that with a specter attack, you can access that memory uh, and pull that those secrets out and, and, you know, basically get secrets, get compromised. To me, um, specter and meltdown was a significant risk from an impact perspective, right? Typically with our risk matrix, we look at likelihood, we look at impact. Uh, and usually it's, you know, the likelihood's pretty easy to guess and impact's difficult. Impact was really high because you could steal secrets and there would be really no um, notice that it happened. Uh, but the likelihood's really low. As far as I know, there hasn't been any like practical uh, meltdown specter type attacks. Um, it would be very uh, bespoke and very, you know, tailored for very specific incidents. Also, the machine would already have to be compromised, right? You're not executing something in the, the lower are the lower kernel architecture of an operating system from, you know, across the internet with a low orbit ion cannon. So you know, there's a lot of things that have to happen for this to succeed. Now, Spectre 2 comes on the scene. Welcome to the party, pal. Let's give that. Welcome to the party, pal. Spectre 2, hashtag first timer in chat. Uh, and now it can attack Linux systems on Intel CPUs. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised. I thought the issue with this whole thing was around the chip architecture, less with the operating system. But I guess um, the way that the vulnerability would get exploited is by accessing the way that the operating system kernel accesses the computer architecture underneath, because uh, that's what an operating system does. It does a lot of things. But one of the key things an operating system does is access hardware on the system on behalf of applications in the user, right? That way, um, you can get memory, you can get, you know, processes, compute, et cetera, stuff like that. So apparently, you know, Linux, no one had looked at Linux yet. Somebody did this. I don't know if I, I almost wonder if this was like an academic, um, I almost wonder if this was like an academic thing. VU second from VU Amsterdam. Okay. Hold on. What's VU Amsterdam? Is this a university or something? Yep. Okay. So my, 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 um, my 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 thinking was 100% accurate. This is academic research, a university in Amsterdam. Um, not that I'm poo-pooing it. Great work, researchers. Like, definitely get yourself published. Take a victory lap. But but 
my thing is typically when you see like very like basically exotic uh unlikely to be seen in mass uh use kind of security vulnerabilities or research it's almost always academic research like i, I that's not a blanket statement it's not always that way <laughs> david robbins is instantaneous fast enough for jerry's patience you know what if the web page loads instantaneously, we're good. Anything short of that and roar. Um, so, anyways, things like this, it's cool to see, but you like this has every hallmark of academic research all over it. Me, you, ZMF, Luke Canfield, Xavier Santiago, we, we're not going back to our business and saying, hey guys, we gotta shut down all the Linux systems. This vector speed v2 specter v2 just dropped. We gotta get the hell out of here. No, no, no. It's like it's it's interesting, but whatever. Like next. AT&T updates recent breach figures. Back in 2021, a threat actor published a trove of AT&T customer data for sale on a hacking forum. This data set included information on over 70 million people. AT&T only confirmed that the data set belonged to them earlier this year. Now the company says the leak impacted 51.2 million customers. AT&T did not respond to questions from Bleeping Computer as to why there's such a large discrepancy in the figures, how threat actors obtained the data in the first place, and why it took years to confirm the leak. And now Last, okay. So this is from, a, I guess, a breach in 2021. Um, AT&T just had a breach, didn't they? Hold on. Hold on. So this data was offered in 2021. Um, and, oh my God, okay. So, all right, here's the deal. AT&T is gonna have some, some splaining to do, okay? AT&T was in the news recently for a breach. The data got pushed out to, you know, uh, threat forums or whatever. Um, and AT&T was like, oh, like, let's take a victory lap. I remember, I mean, let's take a, sh a walk of shame. I remember talking to my students at the Citadel and saying, hey, listen, does anyone have AT&T? Because I always ask my students, I, if you don't know, I'm faculty at the Citadel uh, Military College. And uh, every semester, I, you know, I get 18, 19 year olds coming in. And I'm like, hey, how many of you have uh, identity and theft protection provided to you because of a data breach? How many of you have ever received the letter? None of them. And I always say, before the semester's out, one of you is going to get a letter. And uh, I came in like, you know, I'm some haughty, um, you know, pompous a-hole. I came in, I remember a couple weeks ago, and was like, all right, who here's got AT&T? And like three kids raised their hand. I'm like, you got an identity theft protection. You got an identity theft, like just short of like dropping the Oprah emotes on my Citadel students. So, um, so that breach was known. Now apparently it's gotten grosser. Um, it, it's related to a breach from 2021. 51 million impacted customers. That totally sucks. How many customers? Let's just do this. How many customers does AT&T have? Let's just see really quickly. Um, well, they generated 30 billion in revenue. I don't know how to how to walk that back. Uh, so number of wire oh, get out of here. Number of wireless subscribers from 27 to 2022. 2022, they had 217 million subscribers. So if we're just talking AT&T cell, about 25% of all of AT&T's customers were impacted. Ew, not good. Um, there isn't a lot to this information. Uh, or to this story, other than why did AT&T wait three years to say anything? If I had to guess, guys, pretty standard procedure. AT&T is a Fortune 500 company. They have really high-end Ivy League lawyers. The lawyers, again, I'm speculating. So tinfoil hat, tinfoil hat. The tinfoil hat indicates that I'm basing this on my gut, not on any evidence. The lawyers are Ivy League lawyers, and they said, Deny, 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 accuse. Like, just we're not gonna we're not gonna come out and say anything until we're required to. And then this second breach here uh, definitely forced their hand. Also coming hot off on the hot on the heels of AT and T having that like one day outage. That was a hot mess. So, you know, AT and T. I know you got Lily for um for a spokesperson, and you're doing great with your iPhone ads, but uh, this is kind of a gross look and not not doing so well.
So if you have AT&T, enjoy your data identity theft and also your letter that privacy and security is serious to AT&T. Now a word from our sponsor, Vanta. The average security pro spends nearly a full workday every week just on compliance. With Vanta, you can automate compliance for in-demand frameworks like SOC 2, ISO 2701, and HIPAA. Even more, Vanta's market-leading trust management platform enables you to unify security program management with a built-in risk register and reporting and streamline security reviews with AI-powered security questionnaires. Over 7,000 fast-growing companies like Atlassian, Flow Health, and Quora use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Watch Vanta's on-demand demo at vanta.com slash CISO to learn more. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash CISO. Before we get back to the news, a quick reminder to subscribe to Capture the CISO. We're launching season two next week. This competitive podcast pits three vendors against one another to see which one can impress our CISO judges the most. The first episode drops April 17th with vendors Anvilogic, Lumius, and Anixia. Click on the blue Capture the CISO logo at the top of CISOseries.com to check out each of the vendor demos before listening to the episode. Now, back to the news. All right, y'all. I hope you're having a good show. I certainly am. I'm feeling great. I hope you are, too. The coffee is coursing through my veins. It's epic. I'm riding the lightning up in here. If you're getting value from the show, if you're entertained, if you're educated, if you're just part of the community, do me a favor, hit that like button right now on YouTube. It basically goes a long way to trigger the YouTube algorithm um, to helping other people find it. That's how, that's how, uh, what is it? Hold on, Mano? Yeah, Fern Malo, first timer. All the first timers in chat, it may be because you all hit the link, uh, the like button on YouTube yesterday. Again, shout out and thanks to the stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber, Anti-Siphon Training, uh, big fan. Also, fun fact, we've got a new sponsor coming on next week uh, for the end of April. Delete me. Uh, just spo- I, like I'm not pumping them right now, but I, I have been using Delete Me for like a, uh, probably like three weeks now. It's very cool. Um, all right. So thanks so much, guys. Uh, again, hope you're enjoying the show. Now, if you want to blow up your professional network... Let me tell you how to do it. I actually have had some people DM me about the challenge. So let me be crystal clear about how this challenge works and how you can get involved. Anybody can engage in the challenge. There's two ways to do it. One, for everybody, go on LinkedIn and search for the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. That's your first step. Then connect with the people posting who are using that hashtag Comment on their posts. That's critical. Comment on those posts. Connect to the people in comments, okay? When you comment on their post, you show up in the comments. When you connect in the comments, then the next people who come through are going to connect with you, right? So the, the, the original post with the Simply Cyber Community hashtag, challenge hashtag, is the anchor. And then everybody on the comments is, you know, basically part of the network. So that's how you uh, build it up, right? Now... Every single day, one person gets the baton. Currently, Amigos182 has the baton. I don't know if Amigos182 is in chat or not, but hopefully Amigos182 is. Now, Amigos182, we did not see your post on LinkedIn, so you need to help us with that too. But go on YouTube. I mean, go on YouTube. Whoever gets the baton, it's very simple. Go on LinkedIn and share your story and then simply use the hashtag simply cyber community challenge. Tag me. I'll amplify it. It's all about good times. Why would you want to do this? Why would you want to do this? Several people in chat have done this challenge. You will blow up your professional network on LinkedIn and your LinkedIn feed will become all cybersecurity content, valuable resources, valuable discussions. If you want to make LinkedIn an actual asset for you, do the challenge. It's as simple as that. Now, every single day of the week has a special um, theme. And Thursdays is what is your meme or what's your meme by Dan Reardon, a.k.a. Haircut Fish. We're doing a little bit of a throwback classic. This right here is 
me at Bucky's. Now, the reason I bring it up is because I'll be driving to Massachusetts in a few weeks, and I've been requested by my family to make a pit stop at Bucky's. Oh my God! Get your la la la's on. If you don't know what Bucky's is, it's basically like this Walmart gas station mega structure. And I don't like crowds. And when I went into Bucky's once to use the bathroom, it was overwhelming, sensory overload. People are screaming, "Welcome to Bucky's!" Like all upside your head. If you don't acknowledge them, they get mad at you. I didn't acknowledge them, so then they just started yelling closer to my head. It is, it is overwhelming. I'm already having anxiety thinking about going to Bucky's. But because I love my wife and children, I will be at Bucky's. There will be no filming of the incident when it occurs. But I just wanted to give a shout out. Welcome to Bucky's. Oh my God! Please help. Please help. Here we go. Welcome to Bucky's. Let's get back to it. We got Jaw Jack with B Sec at the end too. The cloud security company Wiz confirmed to Fortune it acquired the startup Gem Security. <clears throat> Though Wiz did not disclose the terms, Fortune sources say the deal closed at $350 million. Gem offers cloud detection and response solutions. This marks Wiz's second acquisition after scooping up the cloud platform Raft in December for a reported $50 million. Wiz CEO Asaf Rappaport told Fortune he sees 2024 as the year of acquisitions in the industry. All right. Wasn't Wiz on the dock? Wasn't there like rumor that Wiz was getting acquired recently? Like, hold on. Rumor, Wiz acquisition. I, I really feel like there was like this hot... Sentinel-1. Yeah, this was like uh, back in September. Oh my God. Oh, I don't have patience for that. Sentinel-1 was like rumored to be buying Wiz. Now Wiz is acquiring Gem Security. We got movers. We got shakers. Um, Look at these guys. Gem Security. These guys are probably walking around. Uh, looking like uh, <laughs> tripods. I mean, it's got to be cool getting acquired, right? I mean, obviously, when you do get acquired, um, you basically have to go work at the company that you got acquired for. They offer you incentives to stick around, et cetera. Um, oh, the rumor was that Wiz was going to be acquired, uh, was going to buy Sentinel One. Look at Wiz, dude. Wiz has got mad, mad deep pockets. I don't know. Um, I don't know uh, much about Wiz. I think that they're a um, like a cloud security type company. Um, I will say if you are, I don't have a lot to comment on this particular story because I don't know what Gem Security does. I don't know what Wiz does. And um, it's kind of hard. There's like very, hold on. God dang. Um, well, uh, let's see. I, I live in Tel Aviv. All right. So one thing, right? Like right off the rip, I don't know anything about either product, but this guy says he lives in Tel Aviv, which is Israel. If you don't know, like literally one of the, like there's, you know, like when you're evaluating a company or a product or whatever, me personally, me personally, if a security product or vendor is out of Israel, immediately they get elevated to like, oh my God, this is great. Like, like almost if it's Israeli based, like you almost have to prove to me that the product's going to suck. Um, Israel, small country, they make amazing security products. Amazing. Like Palo Alto's out of there. Um, well, I mean, Jesus, there's, there's a whole bunch, like a lot of acquired services. Um, people in chat, if you know any companies out of there, um, drop them in chat. I mean, there's just a million really, really good companies. So I'm not surprised that they're kicking it and getting acquired. Um, so Wiz acquired, uh, Raft, a developer focused cloud platform. And now they're closing the acquisition on Gem um, for believed to be $350 million. Not a bad payday, uh, of course. Uh, the one thing I would say is if you're interested in kind of the ecosystem of mergers and acquisitions and how it impacts cybersecurity, right? Um, let me share, because like here, really quickly, um, really quickly, like we are practitioners and maybe your head's down on the keyboard. You just want to be an engineer and technical and like, do, 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 do. oh yeah, NSO group. Jesus, may, can I mention them? NSO group and Pegasus. Thank you, BSEC. So here's the deal. If you just want to be an engineer and have your head down, that's fine. But if you're more interested in the broader macro picture and the movers and shakers and like, you know, business dealings and how things meet, like what they mean and 
I mean, it, it doesn't hurt. And if you're going to be a CISO, it's almost like it almost benefits, not almost, it benefits you to have a larger picture of what's going on, especially when you're making commitments for three years, five years, tech stacks, interoperability, uh, best of breed, ho you know, homogeneous uh, environments, heterogeneous environments. Like there's a lot to it besides just being like, I can crack on a SIM. Okay. So if you are interested in learning more about, um, you know, the kind of the financial side and like the, the, the levers of business that actually move the cybersecurity industry, it, it, it's a real thing. Um, let me just recommend this newsletter uh, from Mike Prevett out of London, Return on Security. This newsletter is phenomenal. If you've subscribed to it, um, then I would love your thoughts in chat. Um, here, I dropped the link in chat right there. Let me know if you subscribed and liked it. But basically, he breaks down the financials of um, you know, venture capitalists, tech startups, mergers, acquisitions within only the cybersecurity community. And it really is get, it really does give you perspective on like where we're going. Right. So for example, if you're reading this newsletter and you start seeing a massive, um, surge in, in, um, liquidity of, of private equity funds, uh, being pushed into businesses, when businesses get funding from private equity or angel investors or venture capitalists or whatever, when they get funding, they're going to grow and start hiring. So if you start seeing a massive influx of investments, that means in four to eight weeks, maybe maybe three, you know, on the outside, three to six months, you're going to start seeing surges of hiring in those businesses, right? So there is impact to us. Also, if you see, you know, a decline uh, in investments and stuff, you can imagine shrinkage and layoffs and potential um, consolidation of businesses and stuff like that. So anyways, return on security. I, I, I read, you know, I read it. I like it. Malicious PowerShell script shows signs of AI origin. Researchers at Proofpoint documented a known threat actor using a malicious PowerShell script that shows indications of creation by a large language model. The script included comments in code to explain specific components, something not commonly seen in malware, indicating the attacker could have used an LLM to make it or copied it from someone that did. The threat actor, known as TA-547, isn't new. They've been operating since 2017 as an initial <coughs> access broker. This particular campaign attempted to steal the Rodamanthus modular info stealer on German targets. All right. I mean, I don't know how they could tell it was AI based, honestly. Um, I don't know if you've been using um, chat GPT or G mostly chat GPT. I noticed it with Gemini is pretty good, but like chat GPT, like when you ask it a question, there's certain like about cyber, there's certain words it likes to use like digital threat landscape and cybersecurity realm. And like, I don't know, it's just like words that you and me, Amy Devine, you know, B Theo, we don't use. <laughs> Shall we play a game? Like it's not how practitioners talk, but anyways, um, PowerShell is code. So, you know, I, I don't know uh, how they did that. Proofpoint is the one uh, who's doing the attribution, which means it's Highly likely that it's being delivered through email proof points and email security gateway uh, provider. So it doesn't say that right here, but I suspect it's being sent through email. Uh, this individual has been an initial access broker since 2017, which means they've been around for a hot minute. Oh, <laughs> all right. This is funny. So BSEC is commenting that they suspect it's AI based because the code is commented appropriately, which is totally LOL and completely. Uh, exposes human developers for, for doing crappy job of commenting their code, which I will be the first to admit my code looks like um, I sneezed on the screen and uh, that's what it is. And AI does a really good job of commenting functions and, you know, et cetera. Um, let's see. I, I'm just looking through this again. I don't research or prep for these things. So I got to kind of look what's up. Um, I can't read that. That's in a different language. Yeah. Here's a phishing email. So it is, it is coming through phishing. Uh, all right. So here's the deal. TLDR. Uh, the story here is about threat actors using AI to write malware. We already know that's happening. Um, if you think guardrails on chat GPT are going to save you, they're not. Um, there's all sorts of hacks and jailbreaks and 
you know, you can even do private LLMs now. And um, there's LLMs on the dark web that like basically have no guardrails. So, you know, th that's not going to stop. The TLDR for me and you, Jason Summers and um, Dave Robbins, really, and Roman X is really educate your end. There's two things, right? Educate your end users that, you know, basically you're not going to be clicking on an LNK file or HTML file. Like, you should tell your end users, you should just be sus of any attachment from anyone, <laughs> period, okay? Second of all, your email security gateway. Hopefully you have a decent one um, because you do want these uh, emails not to come through. Uh, third, your firewall, like once they stop, once they stop selling or, or sending attachments, they'll start sending links to like OneDrive, Google Drive, Dropbox which will basically pull down that file. Um, so if you can somehow have like wildfire or some type of like uh, dynamic firewall, next gen firewall that, that stops those things from happening, cool. Defense in depth, right? Have an EDR agent or some type of anti-malware on your box as well. Um, don't allow PowerShell to run, um, you know, under the, like un unless it's under certain permissions. There's a lot of different things to do, but, you know, crap happens. So be mindful of, of this. And, um, you know, it's just, it sucks. Also, if you find a random PowerShell file, um, you know, you can, again, you can open up, be careful, right? Cause I don't want you to accidentally double click on it, but you can right click open with notepad or whatever, a PowerShell script. PowerShell is just an interpreted program, which means it doesn't have to be compiled. Uh, like an interpreter just runs it, right? The PowerShell interpreter. So you can right click, open with notepad, look at the PowerShell. You can actually read the comments, see what it does. You could also right click, select all, copy, drop it into something like ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT, what does it do? You can also take it, going back earlier to my my almost emphatic love for any dot run earlier in the show, you could go to any dot run, spin up a quick little Windows 7 VM or something, run the PowerShell on it, see what it does. There's a, there's a lot of things to do here, okay? TLDR, threat actors, this is not news. Like if, if you, I'll tell you what, if you see this story and you're like, oh my God, AI for malware? Oh, oh my God. Like, you, I, I don't know where you've been, but like the, the second chat GT, GPT came out, this was like the first thing people were thinking. We're like, oh Jesus, we got to get on this. Shall we play ISPs again? respond to nutrition label deadline. As of April 10th, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission requires internet service providers to publish so-called nutrition labels detailing costs, fees, typical service speeds, and any data limits to customers. The FCC first proposed this requirement back in 2016. These use the same design language as the familiar nutrition labels seen on food packaging required for both online and in physical stores. ISPs with less than 100,000 lines have until October 10th to comply. Oh my God, they're actually going to make it look like the nutrition facts label. Okay. You know what? Good. Good, 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 good. First of all, I like that small ISPs have been excluded from this. I feel like legislation always kind of screws the little guy or the little lady or whatever small the small business uh this is pretty cool so let's see what they've got to start doing and by the way i guess this is going to show up in your bill um and it's going to break it down this is the price we offered it for you at the beginning this is how long it applies this is what your bill is going to be like after broken down discounts bundles very cool like i mean i have um I have broadband to my house. It's AT&T fiber. You know, I find the bill is, you know, pretty well laid out. It, you know, it's, you know, I don't know. I don't know if like, I don't know about you guys, but like, I don't feel like my broadband bill is like made to be deceptive or all sorts of other things. So this is good. I mean, I think, I think having information for consumers uh, to be able to, you know, understand what they're paying for and everything is awesome. The FCC, by the way, is basically the federal agency that protects consumers, if you didn't know that. Um, so by doing this, obviously, there's been some shady shenanigans going on uh, to screw people over. And I appreciate that they're doing this. Um, just as a complete editorial, I really wish that like, um, 
like Ticketmaster had to do this. I know this is a total editorial, but I feel like when you buy a ticket to an event, there's like service fee, broker fee, contract fee, FU fee, extra fee, fee for something else. And then like your ticket price and you're like, the ticket was like $18 and I'm paying 137. What the hell? What's going on here? Sorry, Kennedy, but uh, Ticketmaster's tough. Also, also with like other, other tickets to other things. Like I just, I, I just hate when you buy something like even, okay. So now I'm on a complete tirade here, Fancy. even like Verbo, right? Rented a Verbo for, uh, for something for my family. And it's like $200 a night. I'm like, Oh, that's kind of reasonable. Let's go. And then, you know, there's like a $50, like suck it fee, a $25 cleaning fee, uh, you know, an $18 just because we can fee. And you know, when you're all said and done, it's like $380 a night. And you're like, what the hell? Like, what, what is going on here? All right. Thank you for uh, allowing me to indulge in my non-cyber content. Consulting firm Attack exposes DOJ data. The Greylock McKinnon Associates Consultancy began sending breach notification letters to victims after it discovered a breach in its internal network back in May 2023. This exposed U.S. Department of Justice data on over 340,000 individuals, including Medicare and personal data. The firm did not release details on any suspected attacker or how they got in. Greylock said it began working with investigators and third-party specialists as soon as it discovered the breach. However, it did not obtain contact information for victims until February 7th. The firm said it deleted DOJ data from its servers after the incident and will offer those impacted the classic 24 months of identity protection. All right. As Rich Struffolino said, you can, you can expect your 18 to 24 months of identity theft protection. You can expect Greylock McKinnon to send you a very nice worded letter, probably written by ChatGPT at this point telling you that your data in the security and privacy of your data is vitally important to them. Um, they've, you know, got legal counsel on board to submit the breach notification standard playbook. You know, as much as I dump on these companies, um, you know what, if it was your company, if it was my company, it, it it's the playbook. Okay. I know it totally sucks for, for everybody. Uh, they did nothing wrong. Like, you know, like it's my data, it's your data. We did nothing wrong yet because of some third party, because some engineer misconfigures something because they didn't patch or whatever. Um, there's a breach and now we are somehow impacted. Um, but you know, like I said, like, let's just say, um, let Joel Belton's ice cream shop to bring back, uh, an old favorite Joel Belton's ice cream shop. You know, you, you, you have like a frequent scoop, um, plan, right? So every time you go in for an ice cream, he, he marks your card uh, and keeps track of how many scoops of ice cream you bought. And every hundredth scoop, you get a free Jim Dandy or whatever. I don't know if Jim Dandies are mainstream, but up in New England at Friendly's, Jim Dandies was like the bee's knees super dessert. It was like the Napoleon, you know, in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, um, the the eat the pig, eat the pig, <laughs> ziggy, ziggy pig. I, I know that's a wicked callback to back Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. But anyways, Jim Dandy was basically that. By the way, just in full disclosure, sorry, I'm I'm today I'm particularly going back into the Wayback Machine uh, for personal things, but whatever. Um, Joel Bellin's ice cream shop, like saving the data in some CRM, Salesforce, and Salesforce has a, a breach. Now Joel Bellin's got to tell all of his ice cream people, thank you, Joel, thank you, VSEC. He's got to tell all his ice cream people that um, you know their data is impacted. So what's he going to say? Hey you guys, you know, like keep buying ice cream, but like, I really don't care about your information security. No, he's got to say what he's got to say. Your security is important to me. It wasn't my fault that things went sideways, but you know, sorry, here, here is Napoleon getting his sticker for eating all of the ice cream. Uh, such a good movie, such a classic. I wasn't a fan of the uh, sequels, but Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, mwah, quintessential um, early nineties jams. Um, anyways, let's go. In today's current climate, is the role of the CISO still... Oh, sorry, really quick. Just as a TLDR for this one, if your business hasn't worked through like basically the aftermath, you could do a tabletop exercise on having a data breach or a ransomware incident, but you should work through like what is the collateral damage afterwards? How are you going to execute? What is your position? What is your narrative? Um, who is going to get involved? Are you going to sue anyone? Um, like these are real questions that you should work through and why you need general counsel, the business, 
executives, leadership at these tabletop exercises. Tabletop exercises are not freaking technical exercises, right? It's important to find out that little little Ben doesn't know how to restore the backups because, well, let's let's say Casual Joseph doesn't know how to restore from the backups because DJ BSEC has been there for 25 years and anytime there needs to be a backup, um, he just you know pulls out his two keyboards like sticks, right? as a callback to earlier in the show. And he's like, I'm doing backup restoration, right? And Casually Joseph's like, I'd love to learn. And b like, you can't hear me because I got the cans on, right? So, but the day that you actually have an incident and you actually need to restore from backups because you're actually down, b is, you know, on vacation down in the Caribbean doing, doing cruising type stuff where there's no internet, right? So um, you've got to, there are technical aspects of a tabletop exercise that you do have to, uh, vet and clear up, but there is also non-technical. So don't sleep on that. All right, let's go. All right, guys, stay tuned. We've got jaw jacking with DJ B second, a hot minute. But before you go, I just want to remind everybody later today at 4 30 PM Eastern time. So in about eight hours, Simply Cyber Live. If you didn't know, I do the news show every morning, 8 AM to 9 AM, but every Thursday, for however long years, I do a long form one hour guest interview with industry practitioners and just really get deep on, you know, their perspective, knowledge share. It's a wicked fun show. Today, Savannah, Savannah, Savannah Lazara is my guest. She's a very accomplished offensive security professional. She was keynote panelist at Red Team Village last year at DEF CON where I was attending and got to uh, see that. She's phenomenal. And I can't wait for you guys to meet her. I can't wait to learn from her myself. So come back, set the notification, whatever you want to do. I'll drop a link in chat to this particular live stream. But uh, let's see if we can uh, bring her into the Simply Cyber community fold and make her feel welcome. I hope you guys uh, can certainly be there and uh, get value from the stream. All right, guys. I am Jerry from Simply Cyber. I've got to go pick up Charles Finfrock. He is guest lecturing my uh, cadets today. Charles was in the studio yesterday filming a micro course and we com completely filmed it. So all the all the production stuff, now it's just post-production. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be a good time. I'm going to go ahead and bring BSEC in. First, let me change my camera. If you don't know what's going on, DJ BSEC is about to join us on stream and take over jaw jacking. Jaw jacking is a 30-minute segment uh, where um, we have industry professionals. There he is. Hey, how you doing? Doing good. Awesome. So Ben is, or DJ BSEC is going to be uh, dropping knowledge bombs on you, answering all your questions. DJ BSEC, what do we got for everybody in the next 30 minutes? We're just going to YOLO this morning. Everybody throw in questions. We had a ton of questions last week, which was great. We don't really have much, um, much in the news as it is. So we'll just answer questions and, and go from there. All right. You can hear that right now. Um, uh, with DJ BSEC, I'll, I'll be in the car. I'll drop a couple questions as I tend to do, even though I'm driving. Uh, BSEC, are you a Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure fan? Yes, I was way back when. <laughs> yeah, it, it was kind of like uh, genre, not genre defining, but like there was nothing really like it at the time. Oh, yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. So awesome. Uh, and yeah, I love it. I love it. All right, guys, I'm going to take, uh, take out, uh, be well, be sec. Thanks for doing jaw jacking everybody. I'll see you at four 30 with Savannah. Why do I keep saying her name like that? I hope I don't say that live on stream. Savannah, the savant. <laughs> yeah, I know. Savannah, uh, Lazar. I'm Jerry mm. until next time. Stay secure. Thanks, Ben. Later. All right, everybody. For those that don't know, uh, this is the time that we have come to, to where everybody, if we take over the show, you guys throw out questions, we'll answer them. So let's go ahead and jump into it and, uh, start jaw deck. All right, y'all let me know if music's too loud, if mics isn't loud enough, and y'all go ahead and chunk in your uh, your questions and we will start to answer them. Like I said, we do not have that much news. I do have one story, so if we do get slow, I'll throw that, uh, throw that story in here and we can look at that. Um, last week we had a whole bunch of questions, so let's uh, 
let's go ahead and throw those questions in and get them answered i've got about 30 minutes that we can go through and answer questions and uh before i have to jump into my first meeting for the day Amy Devine, I, this just, I just saw this and it's just popped up. I would love to talk about keeping physically and mentally healthy in the field. That is not necessarily a question, but that is a great statement and a great question. And I would, I would even throw this out to everybody that is in, uh, in chat right now. What do you do to stay physically and mentally healthy and fit? Uh, in your day-to-day -day actions so for me um i've said this before on stream i work usually i usually work for me starts at about 6 to 6 30 central time in the morning and i go until about six o'clock at night maybe sometimes later depending on what i've got to do because there are th some things that after hours network stuff and other things but so my day usually goes about 12 hours and usually what I do is I break my day up because if you don't break it up, you're going to get burnt out. Burnout is a, is a real thing. You do hear people in the industry talk about it, uh, in the middle of the day, usually around 11 AM, 12, 12 PM, right in the middle of the day, I will go for a walk. And it's usually about an hour long walk, whether that's throwing on, uh, you know, Jack Recider and Darknet Diaries on a podcast and just walking mellow out, um, putting on some music, going for a run, doing something along those lines to split up your day, number one, and to get your mind off of everything else and just clear your head. I can't tell you how, uh, how much it means to go out and clear your head and basically you're starting from scratch again um, after you come back, right? For me, that is, it's huge. Um, for being physical, I mean, th that is not only just mental, but that's also physical, right? Because you're getting out and walking. A lot of people today, with everybody working from home, everybody wakes up in the morning. Some of us don't even get off our couch, <laughs> Kimberly. But uh, some of us just stay at home all day long in our uh, in our room and, and work. And then as the day comes at five, six, seven o'clock at night, then we just leave and walk out and we never actually get out and lift weights walk or do any anything physical so you've got to make sure that you keep your your body in physical shape and in mental shape to be able to do this job for sure all right let's scroll down uh david atkins is asking what what are your thoughts on stacking certs, Google, Sec Plus, C So when we're talking about stacking certs, th that list right there is a massive one. So you're talking Google Security, then Security Plus, then uh, CYSA, and then CISSP. For me, looking at that list, that's about a 10 year gap right there, right? Number one, CISSP means that you've been in the industry for at least you have at least five years of experience in the industry and you have somebody that is going to vouch for you so yes you can go take cissp test you will end up getting a cissp associate you will not be a full cissp until you have somebody in the industry that can write the recommendation that can say yes i this person passed the test but they also know what they're talking about and they have done it um Google, Security Plus, CYSA, those are all uh, certifications. For me, when it comes to certifications, depending on if you actually need the certification to have the job, there's no real reason to have the certification unless it's just something that you want to have, number one. It's the information that you're gonna gather from the certification. Um, I actually had this conversation with somebody a couple of days ago about networking they were talking about network plus versus ccna and when we talk about network plus versus ccna what which one do you get and for me i say you go get ccna yes ccna is vendor based it's based for cisco and net plus is vendor agnostic right but 
Net Plus is extremely basic. They give you everything across the board and there isn't any hands-on training or hands-on troubleshooting. With CCNA, you have you will learn everything that's on Net Plus, number one. But number two, to actually pass the test, you actually have to have your hands on the keyboard with networking and be able to troubleshoot and configure those switches. So yes, if somebody walked in, um, if I had two people walk into me and say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to, I want to be your junior network administrator. And one of them had net plus and the other one had CCNA CCNA to me covers more because they've had those, that hands on, if that makes sense. So when we fall back to what you're asking here, David, getting the information and understanding what it is like with the Google, the sec plus, the, that's that's all fine and that's all theory. It's a matter of do you actually, can you actually uh, use it? Can you actually do it in the job, right? You can read a book, everybody can read a book and everybody can turn around and go, this is what this is. Can you actually do the job? So stacking search to me is is nothing. At that point, if you, if you walk in with a resume and you have 50,000 certs on your resume, to me, you know what that means? That, that somebody's just sitting over there doing certifications or that they're probably just paying somebody to, to have a certification with their name on it. That's just my opinion. You're saying my mic volume's a little low or is the music too high? Um... George Strasberger. Oh, uh, let me let me pull this up and I will show you. So George is asking what uh, what my channel is. So my music channel, the the stuff that I do a lot of things on, is on Twitch, and it is uh, that's not Twitch, is it? That's my there's my Twitter. And grab this, I will throw this into chat. So I'm on Twitch. Um, the reason I'm on Twitch is because on Twitch you can actually play music. You don't get, uh, they don't kick you off like they will on YouTube. YouTube is very DMCA uh, or DCMA um, compliant. Twitch actually has spoken with a lot of the music uh, big wigs. I think the only one they don't have, they may have it now was Sony. Um, so they allow you to actually play music without kicking you off. So yeah, you can go check that out. Every now and again, I do, uh, I think last weekend it was, I do uh, a music stream. We have fun on there. I jump around, act stupid, uh, do stupid things. Let's see. There's a, a, there's a quick little... You can kind of see what it is that we're doing in here. We got different types of things going on music so i think that was a christmas time um what do we got next uh tim mcdonald thoughts about ztna versus vpn Let's see if i can find this so i can put it up do i have one tim mcdonald's asking what are the thoughts about zero trust network versus vpn um to me, that all just depends on... Hey, anyway, I'm not able to scroll and see what's going on in here. Um, to me, that just depends on uh, company. Like, what do you, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? What do you want to do? Um, zero trust networking is, you know, that's the big buzzword now. The big one. VPN's been around forever. Um, it just depends on how, how, you're, how you and the company um feel about going and how people are going to access stuff right a lot of people like i said before a lot of people are at the work from home state so they may have to have a vpn um and on vpn you can do quote unquote zero trust networking within some of these uh next gen firewalls you can set it up to where they can only access specific things um you're only trusting specific devices to connect to your vpn so there's a there's a lot to it um both both to me technologies work and are, are are good um let's see we got george in here david robinson's please explain on the fitness topic while sitting in a chair all day 
So David Robbins, that's that's what I was getting at. Um, don't sit in a chair all day. You have to break it up. If you if you were at work, and I, and I'm assuming you're saying this from working at home all day long. If you were at work, you would not sit in your office all day long. You would have people walk in your office and talk to you. You would get up and go to the water to the you know water fountain. You would go take a, a bio break. You would you would get up and move around. When we're at home, we get very. Uh, it's easy to just to sit in your room and just knock stuff out all day long, mess around on the computer, uh, do your work. You have to break that up. You've got to get up and move. So for me, like I said, my day usually starts around 6.30 ish. Um, and by 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, to me, I shut it down. Shutting it down means I get up, I leave this room and I go for a walk. And hopefully it's not raining or any of that stuff. Or if it is, I, I go get on a treadmill. But I go for a walk and it not only does it break up the day, so the day doesn't seem like it's extremely long, but it allows you to get physical. Uh, you, you're, you're able to have physical activity. And then because you're not sitting in front of the computer and you're not hammering stuff out or looking up stuff and researching, it gives you that mental break as well. That's what I meant by getting up. Don't sit in the chair all day long. Get your butt out of the chair. Uh, what do we have here? Yeah, Dave Robinson Space Tacos question. What's something that you were able to learn rather easily? What's something that was the most difficult for you to learn? All right. Um, that question is probably the exact same answer, honestly. So one of the things, if you, if anybody has dealt with networking before, you understand uh, that subnetting always messes with everybody. Um, for me, I learned subnetting pretty quickly, but it was very hard. Um, it was, once you understand it, 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 it just clicked. Um, I see a lot of people that have a lot of trouble with subnetting. Um, and uh, those are most of the questions that I get of, how do I understand, what subnetting do I need to do? How do I understand it? Um, there are, there are so many different tools and techniques to do it. For me, it it was, when I first started off, I was like, what in the world is this? This doesn't make any sense. I need to have a slash 29, a slash 28. Why is every everybody in the world always says just 24? Just use 24. Why would anybody use something more than 24 or something less? Um, so that, that actually, once I understood that and learned that, um, it went real easy. It, it was real easy, but it was one of those things where at first I was like, you didn't even want to do it because there's so many bits and bytes and zeros and ones and things turned off and on that um that it, it's very it was very daunting to start off with but then you know after after a week or so it was nothing but that is always a big question and that's one of the biggest things in networking um josh how can i give how can i give tips uh to my peers to get into the door i get asked this all the time uh, so that's from Jamal. Let me see if I'm at. Just trying to find out so I can put this on screen. Um, yeah, Phil, here you go. Uh, subnetting. Subnetting. Subnetting is not. Yeah, I will say this. Subnetting and learning subnetting is for tests for the most part. When you're out in the real world, and you're building a network, you're going to pretty much know how much that network needs to scale or not scale. And there are tools out there to get you the quick, the subnets real quick. So, um, how can I give tips to, to my peers? Um, just give them the same advice that you would look for. Right? So for me, if somebody's, if somebody comes to me and says, well, you know, how am I going to break into cyber? How do I get into networking? Well, number one, you have to understand the basics. A lot of people, uh, and you hear everybody in the industry talk about this all the time. You have somebody come to you and say, um, I've been working on X, Y, Z. How do I get into cyber? That's great that you've been, you've done your sec plus. That's great that you've done your net plus but you have zero experience and you've never worked on a help desk. You don't understand what's going on, um, but you have all these certifications. 
and you think that the certifications because you have the piece of paper and you can put it on your resume that you should be able to walk in hand them your resume and say see i have these certifications and that they're going to hire you on the spot because of that that is not the case and i'm and, and you know i don't want to break anybody's hearts but that's not the case when it comes to this if i have it, it, i'll give you an example if i have a person that comes to me they have their a plus their net plus their sec plus they have but they've never worked on a help desk they've actually never been in an environment and then have a person over here that's been on help desk for the last two years so they've done two years of troubleshooting working with individuals they've trouble they've done troubleshooting of connectivity of laptops and desktops to the network they've done troubleshooting of somebody downloading malware or spyware on their machine and they've learned how to clean it that person to me understands more to get a job done than somebody with just the certification right because to me to me those two people combined are you're going to be your ideal person right the person's got two years on the help desk person that's got uh their certifications they've gone and, and learned everything but if you're separate and you have you have experience versus textbook as a practitioner you're sitting across from those two people you can start asking uh, if you start asking questions to the person with just the certifications they're not going to be able to answer your questions for the most part the ones that do do the work will be able to answer and understand what it is i think that's where where we fall short is that we go out and we get our certifications and you understand the theory but you don't actually understand the impact of what happens when you're actually on the floor or on uh in the in the realm of what's going on i hope i didn't break everybody's heart with that all right who who was that from that was jamal cyber eddie how important are presentation skills for cybersecurity industry um cyber eddie that that's a great question it it honestly depends on what you're going to be doing um if you're an auditor that's coming in and and um going to be giving the presentation at the end of the audit or the end of the assessment presentation skills are are grand right you have to be able to sit to convey to the executives or to whomever it is that you're going to be speaking to of what the assessment showed so you'll have to have some type of presentation if you are the red team or the pen tester that's doing it you don't need presentation because you're going to just put stuff together and hand it over to the person that's going to go give a presentation um if you are a blue teamer that's sitting in the background um checking out phishing messages or uh running some threat hunting to to find out you know what malware was on here or did did something get infected over there you don't necessarily need a presentation you might have to have uh like an incident report that you're going to put together mainly those incident reports are just going to be for the help desk and for for y'all to to be able to um to go back and look at when it comes to presentations you're looking at uh, mid manager management level upper management level that are going to be giving presentations for uh, for like capex or opex projects that are going to be coming in so for instance hey um as a company we've got 10 year old firewalls we need to replace those then you're going to go give a presentation or you're going to give a write-up and explain why it is that you should be replacing those well they're 10 years old they're out of date they're out of you know our, our maintenance windows over with them we need to move over to these new ones because now we have maintenance windows now they're up to date we get the latest and greatest all of those type of things so presentation just depends on what what the job is um basic um how let's see how do you get the experience even the help desk roles want want you to have two years experience carrie carrie's asking the question how do you get experience if help desk is wanting two years carrie if if help desk is asking for you to have two years um they must be asking for a specific role in help desk um they're not asking for an entry level position if they're if it's two years um most entry level positions and help desk positions will not require um two years one year most of those positions are giving uh if you if you're new to the help desk you usually have a script that you're going to follow um 
you're going to come in on an interview for a help desk. They're usually going to ask you a couple of very easy questions to make sure that you understand how to troubleshoot. Um, but if they're asking and saying that you have to have two years for, for a help desk, two years for a help desk, that doesn't make sense. Maybe you have two years experience to go into a sock or to go in into something in cyber but for just your average daily help desk you should not they shouldn't be asking for two years great questions we got a lot this morning um so jamal is saying uh Let me, let me, let me take this one and I'll go back to them all. So Taekwon Gong is saying, what type of help desk are you referencing? Because all help desks are not the same. That is correct. All help desks are not the same. Some help desks are specific to a uh, specific technology. Um, so from, in my experience, I started off at a company that all we did was help desk. I started off on a help desk that um, it was for, for, um, for satellite dishes, right? So when it came to troubleshooting, I was getting users calling in. Uh, this was 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Users calling in, I think it was for Hughes Network and Hughes TV. So I was getting users calling in, um, telling me that their satellite dish didn't work, right? I can't get a picture, I can't get this, I can't get that. I'll give you all a funny story. This is where understanding how to troubleshoot something comes in to help desk. And it doesn't matter what help desk you're on, if you have the, the capability and the ability to troubleshoot line by line uh, and think about things in this sense, um, this is this is how you get into help desk and how you kind of progress in IT. I had a user call me one time and they said they couldn't get uh, they were they couldn't get a picture. There was no picture on their on their TV. It wasn't working. So I'm walking through all these different things, right? Is your asthma set up right? Is this right? blah, blah, blah. And the guy told me, yeah, everything, nothing's changed. And I said, well, do this for me. Go outside and let's see if there's anything blocking it. And he said, well, I can't go outside right now. So red light goes off. Like, why can't you go outside? Well, it's 15 below zero. It's 15, well, where are you at? And he was up, in, up, uh, up north. So it's 15 below zero. But yeah, and we just had a, an ice storm. So there's ice all over the dish and it was ref reflecting the signal. So, I mean, right there, troubleshooting. Okay, sir, well, there's nothing I can do for you. You're gonna have to get wait till the ice melts off and then you're gonna be able to get signal. So troubleshooting when it comes to help desk and like you said, Taekwondo Gong, every help desk is different. Um, you're not gonna be on a help desk, leave that help desk, go to another one. It's gonna be the same thing. There are, there are knowledge bases within help desks that help you go through the troubleshooting in each one. So yeah. Um, so Jamal asked, how can I get more of my peers who are interested in cyber in the door? Jamal, I, I mean, unless you have a job where you can hire them, I don't know how you're going to get people in the door. You're going to have, I mean, if you are in a position to hire people, then that's how you can get people in the door. Um, I don't, I don't know how you are going to go tell somebody to hire your friends. Level up goddess. If we don't get jobs where we are, wait, wait, if we don't get jobs where we are gonna, oh, if we don't get jobs, where are we going to get experience? Tech is only field that does that, which is ridiculous. They even want us to have experience when you apply to help desk job and internship. So level up goddess. Let's, um, let me see if I can, where's level up goddess. I want to put this on. I want, I want this on the screen because we want, let's talk about this. Take me a second. Let me find it. Cause it is, this is a, a great question. This is a great topic to talk about. Here we go. Found it. All right. So if you can't get a job, how are you going to get the experience? That is the $64,000 question that they always ask, right? And everybody screams at it. How am I supposed to get experience if I can't get a job? There are hundreds of thousands of ways to get experience. 
you can create labs you can do labs and i know everybody out there is going well if I, that's doing it on my own time and i don't get paid for that what i want is my experience in the door my foot's in the door and i'm working that's how i get experience you get experience by doing it i did not get experience through networking by walking into it into the network and or walking into a company and going give me give me access to all your switches i need to learn how to do this i went out i used packet tracer from cisco to learn and understand how things worked number one that got me the experience now i understand how something goes from one switch to another and i understand the the traversing across the network number two how do you how do you move uh farther on right i understood that you know gns3 is even more so i moved to gns3 got more experience now i understand how to configure a router now i understand how to configure a switch there are ways to get experience other than just being in the door at a place then when you walk in right and yes you have no no years of experience you can turn around and go yes i have not been on the help desk yet this is going to be my first job i'm really excited to do this for the last six months i've i've been working on gns3 this is what i've done here and the interviewer will ask you about the stuff that you've been doing and if you can give them the correct answers on the things that you've done the, the projects that you've done the uh the labs that you've done that shows you have the experience when i'm talking about experience i'm not talking about experience that oh yes i worked for a company and i'm on a help desk i'm talking about physical experience and you being able to prove that you know what's going on not just that hey i read a book about this and now i i passed the certification that's great you read a book that's great that you passed the certification that's great you know the information how are you going to apply it this is how i applied it i went out there and i i took uh i created labs i did this hey here's my github you can go check out my github and see all the all the powershell or all the python that i wrote to be able to make this lab work that gives you and shows you how to that will show them that you understand and have that experience that goes a long way uh next one rabsec are there any private methods to bypass censorship udp block i think somebody asked this question before we're not going to go into bypassing uh that's not what we're about over here i'm not going to start telling you how to bypass different things um especially censorship there are there are ways out there to to do things like that um all right we got about three minutes left any more questions um great questions out there uh i see one from carrie what does this one say it says how do you get the experience even if it does you oh we yeah we think i just answered that so we have anybody else in here what do we got going Let's see, SP walkthrough. I'm just kind of reading through all this. It looks like Joel Harrison agrees with me 100% on something. I don't know what. I've said a lot. Oh, Valentino. Uh, I'm not trying to break hearts. What I'm trying to do is, is explain to you how it, how things are going. I don't want everybody to be walking in and thinking, oh, I got all these certifications and that's just going to get me in the door. You've got to understand just because you have the piece of paper doesn't necessarily 100% mean you understand how to use it. That's why I say labs and getting your getting your feet wet um through through doing labs and through doing uh some of the work creating that stuff and improving to people that that's what you, that you do have the experience you don't necessarily like i said you don't have to work for somebody to have experience you can build your own home labs you can do all that stuff to prove that you understand how it work, how everything works like phil saying he's he owned a owned a business let me tell you there's a lot learned the hard way when you're out in the field that 100 percent i agree with that um all right this is we're we're coming to the end and i will let's look at this one tracy's asking can you speak about those who are pivoting into cyber and getting certs so depending on what you're pivoting in from um jerry has like uh, i think a hundred thousand million videos of pivoting into cyber um on his site um 
so you guys can go check that out and see what if you if you're pivoting from one of those specific ones jerry will will walk you through on pivoting when it comes to pivoting um from cyber number one and you're you're getting certifications i 100 percent am and down with that if you're pivoting from one one uh place to another a lot of the times let's look at it this way when you're pivoting from one role to another role right so say you're going from um executive to like you know, say you're going from sales into it right do those overlap in any way they there are some overlappings there are some things technical no so use what you have on the sales side into um into uh into the it side number one when when we get into pivoting into cyber and getting certifications getting the certifications falls back on showing that you understand the theory and know what's going on with it that's where i would go hold on just a second uh okay um pivoting into cyber sorry i, I got distracted by somebody sending me over a message um pivoting into cyber from another uh position 100 get the certification get something because that gets your mind you get your mind into the right set right because now you're over here and you were talking about being in sales and understanding the hell of sales now you got to get into that cyber mind how do you understand what's going on in the cyber so if you go take a test or you go get a certification you start moving your your mindset into that oh now i'm thinking about grc i'm thinking about policies how am i going to block things how am i going to do stuff it's a whole different mindset of than what you were in so yes pivoting into cyber getting um getting certifications allows for a, a smoother transition i would say um but yeah for 100 go for certifications when it comes to pivoting over into cyber all right uh we are two minutes past 8 30. um i loved all the questions i'm sure there's some i've missed um if there if you if you put a question in here and i didn't get to it because i do have to run to a meeting um throw it up on discord tag me on discord and i will reach out to you and answer your question or somebody on discord will we'll, we'll get it answered um we'll get it answered today let's see for now um let me go through this don't forget today at 4 30 uh jerry has a fireside chat with what did he say savannah he's got a fireside chat with savannah from the red team village at 4 30 eastern on the channel and then uh tonight we've got jesse j and security plus uh going through your security plus certification so if you're working on that certification or if you are new to cyber if you're new to this channel um go over and check out jesse on security plus and uh get that mindset right for uh for cyber all right that's gonna do it for me today um i hope everybody has a great rest of the day and we will see everybody back here tomorrow for the daily cyber brief till then see you guys if you enjoyed that content keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other simply cyber community resources we have the discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going you can connect with me directly on linkedin and also every single weekday morning on the simply cyber channel we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings 8 a.m eastern time as well as thursday at 4 30 p.m we're doing live stream interviews with industry experts and we produce videos that we push out every wednesday morning